This blue marble-like planet looks just like Earth, but only five seconds on this hostile death orb would kill you. Welcome to HD 189733B. This planet is enormous, even larger than Jupiter. And to keep comparing it to the largest planet in our solar system, it's also entirely made of gas. That's why scientists classify HD 189733b as a hot Jupiter. This planet is located so close to its star that it completes its orbit in just over two days. Yeah, HD 189733b is 13 times closer to its sun than Mercury is to our sun. And even though its star is cooler than ours, this fake Earth is still way outside its star system's habitable zone. That means no liquid water can exist on a planet's surface. Just how this giant gaseous planet developed so close to its star is still a mystery. One theory is that HD 189733b formed right next to it during the star's earliest moments. Or it could have developed further away, only to be pulled in as the rest of the planetary system formed. But there's one thing we know for sure. A visit to HD 189733b would be a plunge into hell with no chance of escape. Now, even if you knew there wasn't a single drop of liquid water on this planet, you'd have a hard time believing it as you approached the giant blue marble. With an average daytime temperature of nearly 1100 degrees Celsius, this planet is twice as hot as Venus, and Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system. One of the reasons for this intense heat is that the planet is tidally locked to its star just like our own moon is to Earth. That means HD 189733b takes as much time to spin on its axis as it does to revolve around the star. So one side of the planet is constantly in daylight, while the other side is shrouded in darkness. The inviting look of this world doesn't come from its oceans like it does here on Earth. No, this hellish planet gets its color from clouds of molten silicate particles. These particles scatter more blue light than red, making the planet appear blue. Silica is the primary ingredient in glass, and you should bring a heavy-duty umbrella because you'd need to take cover from what would essentially be hot, molten glass rainstorms. But that's not the only danger you'd need to be ready to brace yourself against the extremely powerful winds that you'd find sweeping across the planet. With speeds up to 7,000 kilometers per hour, these gusts are almost 30 times stronger than even the most powerful Category 5 hurricanes on Earth. Compared to the strongest winds on other planets in our solar system, HD's winds are almost four times stronger than those on Neptune. But hey, they might smell a little better than the ice giant's hydrogen sulfide clouds. Those carry a whiff of rotten eggs. Blech. HD's winds are so fast that they'd whip past you at about six times faster than the speed of sound. They would be extremely loud, but I think you'd be more worried about them tearing your body apart. You might be long gone by now, killed by that molten glass rain. In any case, you wouldn't last too long on HD 189733b. I really don't recommend traveling there. But there are some planets out there that can kill you even faster. Check out OGLE TR56b. This gas giant sits in a galaxy nearly 100 light years away from Earth. It's even larger than HD. Its mass is nearly 1.4 times as much as Jupiter's, and somehow it's even closer to its star, too. You'd find this world to be incredibly scorching hot. Surface temperatures on this planet average around 1700 degrees Celsius. That's so hot that it turns metal to gas.
Of all the planets in the universe, Earth is clearly the best for life, right? Eh, wrong. Earth may be great, but scientists have discovered a few worlds that could be even better for life. Behold, KOI 5715.01. Most of the contenders on our super habitable planet list aren't the ones you could visit anytime soon. They are very far away. The top spot is held by one 3,000 light years away from our solar system. KOI 575.01 would appear to satisfy the most basic requirement for supporting life. It exists in the Goldilocks zone of its star, so conditions wouldn't be too hot or too cold for a key life-supporting ingredient to exist on its surface, liquid water. But it would also check off many boxes to be considered super habitable. The planetary system it belongs to could be five and a half billion years old, which would make it around one billion years older than our own solar system. And the planet would almost fit the size requirement. When looking for super habitable worlds, scientists keep their eyes peeled for planets that have a mass up to one and a half times of our planet. And they should be about 10% larger too. This size difference would help the planet retain heat. And if its average temperature was about 5 degrees Celsius higher than Earth's, well, this planet could have even richer biodiversity. Now, being almost double the size of Earth, KOI 5715.01 might overshoot this condition a bit. Besides, studies indicate that this planet is actually colder than Earth. But there's still hope. With the right atmospheric composition, a strong greenhouse effect could raise temperatures to the desired level. And as far as super habitable worlds go, well, we're just getting started. Approximately 2,700 light years away is Kepler 69c. This super Earth could be around 7 billion years old. This puts it perfectly in the estimated 5 to 8 billion year old age range for superhabitable planets. This range is based on the 3.5 billion years it took for complex life to appear on Earth. So the best chance for finding life could be on a planet a little older than us. Only this exoplanet could be a little too big to be superhabitable. It has a mass almost four times that of Earth. A rocky planet this big could have a single colossal continent that would have huge deserts in its center. But the coastline washed by Kepler's ocean could be your perfect spot to move to. Our next super-Earth shares a similar name, Kepler 1126b, except it would be located ever so slightly closer to home. Yeah, this planet is about 2,073 light years away, and it belongs to a system that is seven and a half billion years old. It also orbits a yellow dwarf star, much like our own. Only Kepler 1126b is two and a half times closer to its star than Earth is to the Sun. But that's no big deal, because the star Kepler 1126b orbits is cooler than ours, so the habitable zone would exist in a range much closer in proximity to it. If you aren't feeling this nearness to a scorching hot star, there's another super-Earth on our list. And it's at a reasonable distance from home. Speculos 2c is located only 106 light-years away. Not that its proximity gives it any kind of advantage. It would still take you well over 200,000 years to travel to this super-Earth. And that's if you moved at the speed of NASA's Parker Solar Probe, the fastest probe ever launched. Speculos 2c does look promising, though. It's about 40% larger than Earth. 
There's also the potential for it being a rocky planet, just like ours. Now, despite the fact that it also exists in a habitable zone, its red dwarf star is still very small. It's only about 15% the size of our sun. So this planet orbits around its star at a very close distance. And this close distance could mean that Speculos 2c is tidally locked to its star. This super-Earth takes eight and a half days to make one full rotation on its axis, as well as one orbit around its star. That would leave one side of the planet in constant daylight and the other in endless night. This means that life could be possible in the Terminator Zone, the thin strip of land between the two sides. We just need to get a better look to find out for sure. You know, of all those planets, I'd be most interested in exploring Speculus. I imagine it smells like gingerbread and cinnamon, and it tastes delicious. My Belgian friends know. Speculus is a famous cookie originating in Belgium. But this planet wasn't named after the cookie. It's actually named by Belgian astronomers after the Speculus Planet Hunting Telescopes. In this case, Speculus is an acronym for Search for Habitable Planets Eclipsing Ultra Cool Stars. Okay. More great space discoveries ahead, including a look at the Bermuda Triangle of Space. But first, I've got something even scarier than that. The closest black hole to Earth, at least that we know of. Black holes are dark, matter-devouring balls of gravity. Most of them are so far away that we don't need to worry about them, but not this one. Meet Gaia BH1. This enormous black hole sits right outside our solar system. Eh, more specifically, 1,600 light years away from us. Now, that might sound like a huge distance, but it's way closer than any other black hole on record. What's worse, we didn't even know about it until now. Despite Gaia BH1 being 10 times more massive than our Sun, we couldn't see it. Scientists usually discover these monstrosities by spotting the gas that a black hole feeds on. These hungry giants are called feeding black holes. Only Gaia BH1 isn't anything like that. This black hole is dormant. It hides in the darkness, patiently waiting for the galaxy to throw it some cosmic matter to feast on. But there's one thing that gave away Gaia's presence. You see, most star systems in the universe are binary. That means they have not one, but two stars orbiting each other. Our black hole neighbor is also part of a binary star system. Except, instead of two stars, this system has one star and one black hole. Yeah, Gaia BH1 was disguising itself as a star. But even though this monstrosity doesn't feed on any gas or matter yet, it still couldn't help but jiggle its star counterpart a little. Yeah, good try, Gaia, but we still caught you. Out there in space, there are black holes a lot scarier than Gaia BH1. And some are so bizarre that they shouldn't even exist. A team of scientists discovered an unbelievable black hole and gave it the melodic name LB1. The weird thing about this black hole is that it's just too massive to be true. Okay, let's get some facts straight. We know of two types of black holes. Stellar black holes are what massive stars become when they die. They're everywhere in the universe. Even in our Milky Way galaxy, there could be as many as one billion of them lurking around. These beasts can be between 10 and 24 times as massive as our sun. The other type of black holes are supermassive ones. These enormities sit at the center of almost every galaxy, including our own. We don't really know how they form, but 
we do know that they're unimaginably gigantic, billions of times more massive than our sun. But LB1 doesn't fit either of these types. At 70 solar masses, it's too enormous to be a stellar black hole, yet it's too tiny to be a supermassive one. Scientists were scratching their heads trying to explain this phenomenon. Some theorized that it might not be a single black hole, but two black holes orbiting each other. Others guessed that LB1 was born of a gigantic star that was still in the middle of becoming a black hole. Well, the answer was simpler than we thought. LB1 isn't a black hole at all. It's an optical illusion caused by two rare stars orbiting each other. It's a unique star system to stargaze. But when scientists said they found an improbable black hole, well, they were wrong. But please, how could you blame them? It's pretty hard to study an object 15,000 light years away. Mistakes happen. The good news is that LB1 didn't upend our understanding of black holes after all. Now, that doesn't mean that black holes can't blow your mind. Remember the one at the center of the Milky Way? Yeah, it's called Sagittarius A star, and it's as massive as four and a half million suns. But there's always a bigger fish in the universe. Sagittarius A star might be the most massive monster lurking in our galaxy, but it's not even close to some of the really big players out there. Like Tun 618? This black hole is devouring matter 10 billion light years away from us. It's as bright as 140 trillion suns. So bright that it outshines its own galaxy. And its mass? Yeah, 66 billion times that of our sun. Yeah, that's right, 66 billion. Tun 618 is horrifyingly big. When scientists discovered it, they began to wonder if even more massive black holes were possible. Of course, the name supermassive wouldn't do bigger black holes any justice, so astronomers came up with a cool name for them, too. Stupendously large black holes, or slabs. Yeah, and then they found one. Move over, Tun 618, there's a new gargantuan black hole in town. This stupendously large monstrosity sits at the center of Phoenix A galaxy, around eight and a half billion light years away from us. It's almost impossible to imagine how enormous this thing is. Scientists think it has a mass of 100 billion suns. That's more massive than some galaxies out there. And it won't stop growing. The event horizon of this black hole at the center of Phoenix A is unimaginably huge too. It has a diameter of about 100 times the distance between the Sun and Pluto. If you jumped on a SpaceX Starship and tried to fly across this black hole, it would take you 2,500 years to complete that journey. Yeah, we're lucky that this monstrous slab is so far away from us that we don't have to worry about it swallowing our solar system whole. But there are two more supermassive black holes very close to Earth. And they're on a collision course with each other. Okay, when I say very close to Earth, I mean 500 million light years away from us, but still closer than a lot of the other scary things out there. Seriously though, we don't know what exactly happens when two supermassive black holes collide. We've never observed a full merger of supermassive giants. Scientists think that they'll dance around each other for about 200 million years before finally becoming one. But this would be a violent marriage. As the black holes spiral together, they'll send enormous gravitational waves through space. Waves so big that 
we'll be able to detect them from our planetary neighborhood. But that's not the scary part. Mergers like that happen all the time, and right now, the Milky Way is on a collision course with the Andromeda Galaxy. When our two galaxies become one, what will happen to the supermassive black holes at their centers? Will they merge too? Would an event like this tear everything in its vicinity to shreds? Yeah, I bet that's what keeps astronomers up at night. Just north of the Martian equator lies a 45-kilometer-wide impact crater that scientists believe may have been the site of an ancient lake. Here at Jezero Crater, scientists theorize that its frozen soil may contain the most significant discovery of humankind, life. On February 18, 2021, NASA's Perseverance rover started searching this crater to find out if we're truly alone. What is the likelihood of life on Mars? What would these Martians look like? And how will we send samples back to Earth? This is What If, and here's what would happen if we discovered life on Mars. As Scientific American puts it, it would take a near miracle for Mars to be sterile. Astrobiologist Chris McKay at NASA believes that Earth and Mars have been sharing materials for billions of years. Kind of like using your roommate's spice rack. What, I thought you said it was communal. Comets or large meteorites that have hit Earth may have also sent debris onto Mars. A tiny fraction of this debris on Mars could have carried the same microbes that kick-started life as we know it on Earth. But what would this alien life look like? Many scientists agree that whatever life on Mars we might find would need to be incredibly robust. With the combination of radiation and freezing temperatures on Mars, could any life form survive such a harsh environment? As far-fetched as it sounds, microbiologists have discovered many organisms that thrive in extreme environments. The tardigrade, or water bear, is a highly resistant extremophile. It can withstand heat, cold, pressure, radiation, and even a complete lack of oxygen. There are also certain types of bacteria on Earth that rapidly produce spores when faced with hazardous conditions. The bacteria can then hibernate during an extended period of drought and withstand intense ionizing radiation. A team of 1,000 geologists, chemists, physicists, and biologists worldwide have drilled 4.8 kilometers into the Earth and discovered robust life forms. Mars has a similar geological past to Earth, so looking underground could be a great place to start. By drilling into the Jezero crater, we could encounter spores associated with a relatively recent geological era. And on future missions to Mars, we may dig deeper and uncover fully vegetative microbes. To find rock samples that might support life, NASA's Perseverance rover uses an array of lasers called a supercam. It can study the surface of Mars at a distance. One of the lasers will heat a rock sample and vaporize it. This creates a plasma that can be analyzed to understand its elemental composition. Another laser will reveal which compounds are in the dirt. If the supercam detects organic molecules or elevated concentrations of elements like nitrogen or phosphorus, the rover will head over to take a closer look. It will then scan the soil in greater detail to detect any organic material hiding in the dirt. 
NASA's team on Earth has only one shot at picking the right spot to gather these samples. With limited space on board the rover, only a few dozen samples can be collected. So, no pressure, and fingers crossed. If all goes well, NASA plans to bring back samples known for preserving biosignatures on Earth. Biosignatures are faint molecular traces left behind by microbes billions of years ago. Once the samples are collected, NASA and the European Space Agency plan two missions to get them back to Earth. This involves blasting tubes of rock and soil samples into orbit to be collected by another spacecraft and then returned to Earth. Whoa, this looks kind of fun. If Perseverance's mission is successful, the discovery of life on Mars would be as groundbreaking as the discovery of DNA. In 1543, Copernicus boldly shook the status quo with his theory that the planets orbited the sun. His discoveries completely changed our worldview, no longer putting Earth at the center of the universe. Discovering life beyond Earth could be just as powerful. But not finding any life could raise more questions. Is the Earth truly special? Are we alone out here? Even if we don't discover life, these Martian rock samples will allow chemists to study the geochemistry, mineralogy, and foundational bedrock materials of Mars in detail. This could provide us with essential insights into the climate history of Mars and help us better understand Earth's climate as well. In 1976, two Viking landers became the first spacecrafts from Earth to touch down on Mars. They too probed for life in the Martian soil, and the results are still debated to this day. One experiment indicated that the Martian soil tested positive for metabolism. On Earth, this would almost certainly suggest the presence of life. But another related experiment found no trace of organic material whatsoever. While most scientists have not reconciled the conflicting results, the consensus is that there's no conclusive evidence of life on Mars. But several researchers disagree. Recent discoveries of terrestrial microorganisms surviving outside of the ISS indicate that life may be resilient enough for Mars. And methane in the Martian atmosphere could be a sign of microbial methanogens, a type of microorganism that produces a significant amount of methane. Stinky aliens. Mind you, it's possible that life on Mars didn't have the right conditions to start at all. Or maybe it died off from an extinction event, similar to the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. Or it's even possible that we might end up finding life that was accidentally brought to Mars by one of our many rovers. Let's hope this Perseverance mission doesn't turn into a $2.7 billion facepalm. If Mars is your bag, well, have you ever thought about setting up shop there? With recent developments in rocketry, colonizing Mars might be possible in our lifetime. Okay, colonizing Mars sounds like a fun idea, but in reality, would you really want to move there? I wouldn't consider it a spare Earth. It's pretty inhospitable. Now, it's possible we could make it habitable, but if we have that kind of capability, why don't we look at something else in the universe that's a little more people-friendly? Well, later on, we'll explore one possible friendly candidate, Kepler-22b, but it's 635 light-years away. You want to make that move? I'm happy to move if the planet has beaches and long summers and waterfalls and mangoes, but unless this planet is better than Earth, I say we stay right here. Watch this. Could there be an even better planet for us than Earth? Scientists are searching for a super habitable world that wouldn't just rival Earth, but be a place where life could thrive even more easily. And they're looking at exoplanets. 
how would we discover Earth 2.0? What would make an exoplanet habitable? And how long would it take to get there? This is What If, and here's what would happen if we discovered Earth 2.0. You wouldn't be able to find an exoplanet by looking through a telescope. All you'd see is the bright glare of the stars they orbit. NASA built the Kepler telescope to discover exoplanets. And before it ran out of fuel, the Kepler telescope surveyed our region of the Milky Way galaxy. Its technology uses the transit method to find planets hundreds of light years away. How? It measured the fluctuation of light coming from distant stars. When a planet transits or passes in front of a star, the star isn't as bright, so the Kepler telescope uses that to detect exoplanets. This is not an easy thing to do, but during its nine-year lifetime, the Kepler telescope confirmed the existence of 4,367 exoplanets. Could any of them be Earth 2.0? If you're a longtime fan of What If, you've probably heard this before, but Earth is a very special place. And even if a planet is deemed to be habitable, it doesn't mean that it resembles Earth very much. A habitable planet is a rocky planet located in the habitable zone allowing water to stay on the planet's surface in its liquid form. That's it. Venus and Mars are habitable planets, but they are definitely not like Earth. So let's talk about three major conditions that we'd look for when searching for an even better version of Earth. First, it would need to have sunlight. Our sun's lifespan is about 10 billion years, and it took 4 billion years for anything more complex than the simplest life form to pop up on our planet. But K-type dwarf stars have lifespans of about 70 billion years. So if we found an exoplanet orbiting a K-type star, there would be more time for life to evolve and live on it. The second major condition is temperature. A planet that's too hot or too cold wouldn't be able to host the life forms we'd need to survive. But if we find a planet that's a mere 5 degrees warmer than Earth, and it has more water, we could be looking at Earth 2.0, covered in a lush, biodiverse rainforest. The third major condition we'd be looking for is size. Gravity retains a planet's atmosphere, and there's a direct relationship between gravity and a planet's size. So, if we find a planet that's only one and a half times larger than Earth, it would be able to hold on to its interior heat and maintain its atmosphere for a longer time. But bigger isn't always better. While Earth-sized exoplanets are usually rocky, about 50% of the exoplanets larger than Earth are gas giants. And if an exoplanet is too small, it would likely be barren, like Mars. So, are there any exoplanets out there that meet these requirements? Okay, I found a planet that could be super habitable. Kepler 1649c could be a contender to become Earth 2.0. It's 300 light years away and orbits a red dwarf star. It gets sunlight, but only 75% as much as Earth, so it might be a bit cooler there. And there wouldn't be any seasons on Kepler 1649c. A full orbit only takes 19 and a half Earth days, so we'd need to get used to that. Oh, and it could be tidally locked, which means one side of the planet constantly faces its sun, while the other side faces space. Also, living on a planet that orbits a red dwarf star could be risky. Sometimes red dwarf stars send out massive flares, dousing an orbiting planet in UV light and creating huge temperature fluctuations. But if we decide that Kepler 1649c is worthy of becoming Earth 
what would happen next? Well, using our current technology, it would take at least 2,000 years to reach this Earth 2.0. And since this planet is so far away, we only know about its size, the distance to its star, and the makeup of its atmosphere. So we could pack up humanity, take the multi-generational trip to Earth 2.0, and discover that it's more like a Neptune 2.0. Uh, yeah. There's no way we could survive on a gas giant. We'd need much more information before we send humans to any possible Earth 2.0s. So, right now, NASA is developing a tiny probe to travel at one-fifth of the speed of light. It could greatly expand our knowledge of exoplanets. And we shouldn't limit ourselves to looking just at exoplanets. A moon receives direct solar energy from its star, and the planet it orbits reflects solar energy toward it. So maybe a moon could be more suitable for human life than an exoplanet. The most Earth-like planet in our solar system is Titan, Saturn's largest moon. So if we want to save thousands of years of traveling, maybe Titan could make a good second home for us. Rockets are incredibly powerful. You can launch yourself into orbit, fly the moon, and soon enough, travel to Mars. But to go beyond our solar system, eh, you're going to need something else. Solar sails. How exactly would sails work out in space? How long would it take you to travel to the edge of the solar system? And why could this journey end with your slow and lonely demise? This is What If, and here's what would happen if you sailed the galaxy on solar winds. To launch a spaceship, you need a rocket to push you up into the sky. That push is called thrust. Being launched from Earth with the power of a rocket gives a spacecraft most of its momentum. After this, you'd need more fuel to change your speed or course. But there are no gas stations out there in space for you to refuel, and that means you can only go as far as your fuel takes you. You see, more fuel means more weight, and in space, your reserves are limited. In other words, it would be really hard to get to your interstellar destination with rockets alone. But all of that is about to change. All aboard! You're set to sail across the galaxy. On Earth, sails have been moving boats around the globe for centuries. They work without any fuel, only the power of wind. But out in space, there are no air particles moving around, so you'd need to harness a different kind of wind. Solar winds carry charged particles ejected by the sun. These particles fly across the solar system at a blisteringly fast 1.6 million kilometers per hour. But with a special type of sail, you could take advantage of that power to get yourself across the solar system and beyond. And no, those special sails wouldn't look much like the sails you're familiar with. Are you ready to have your mind blown? This is the contraption that could take you across the galaxy. It's called electric sails, or e-sails. They're kind of like an umbrella without fabric, only these ribs would be made of electrically charged aluminum wires, and they can be as long as 20 kilometers, while also being no thicker than about half of one strand of hair upon your head. Now, all you'd need is the solar wind, and you could sail across the deep, dark sea of outer space. Wait, 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 wait. Um, there's one catch. You see, you'd still need chemical rockets to launch you off into space to begin with. That's because electric sails don't work within Earth's magnetosphere. The magnetosphere is the area around the planet that's under the influence of its magnetic field. It's up to 10 times larger than Earth itself. And to escape it, 
you'd need a little boost from the old school rockets. Or you could build a spaceport around Earth. It would have to be far enough so that the planet's magnetic field doesn't reach it. But, you know, that would get too expensive and take too long to construct, and we want to send you on this journey right now. So you'd launch your ship from Earth and out of the magnetosphere's limits. From there, it would be smooth sailing. With a 1,000 kilogram spacecraft like yours, you'd have about 100 wires to catch solar wind particles. You'd be a pioneer voyaging through space with this fantastic new technology. After one year of sailing, you'd reach a speed of at least 30 kilometers per second. And you might even go as fast as 150 kilometers per second. Yeah, and that's really fast. Faster than Voyager 1, the fastest space probe humans have ever sent off-world. The Voyager 1 probe is hurtling through space at about 17 kilometers per second. After spending three years getting past Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, you'd end up beyond the orbit of Neptune. You'd navigate by simply changing the voltage levels on different wires of your electric sails. Yeah, well, you'd still have to be a navigational genius to sail safely, especially when you get closer to the outer edges of the solar system. Here, you have to pass through the Kuiper Belt. This area is filled with icy comets, and if you're not careful, these comets will do some hefty damage to your electric sails. Yeah, your interstellar trip might end before you even get out of our planetary neighborhood. After that, you've still got a long way to go to the very end of the solar system, the heliopause. It's four times further away from the sun than Neptune. So, Fasten your seatbelts and power through a pretty uneventful view for about 10 more years. Yeah, I know, I know, you'd prefer a view of Jupiter or Uranus instead. But hey, it's almost time to explore worlds you've never seen. Ooh, ah, I just remembered I was supposed to tell you something important. Yeah, you know how your electric sails need solar winds to uh, sail? Well, uh, now you'd be the furthest from the sun you've ever been, and that means there won't be as many solar particles pushing your spaceship forward. Your sailing might just come to a complete stop, leaving you stuck forever in the outskirts of the solar system. Cold, lonely, and hopeless. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, this could be how your days come to an end. So, while you still have some life left in your sails, you'll need to navigate to another star. If I were you, I'd head to the Alpha Centauri star system. It's the closest one around, and it has not one, but three stars. Now, you should also know that not all stars are equal in providing you the powerful solar winds you so desperately need. Passing by a red dwarf star like Alpha Centauri C, also known as Proxima Centauri, you'd experience luminosities that could be anywhere from one-tenth to one-ten-thousandth as strong as our own sun. But despite this, you might be able to gain enough accelerating power to reach super high speeds once again. And all this without any chemical fuel. Yeah, going green is the cool new thing everyone's talking about. Yeah, sailing across the universe is fun until the solar wind dies down. Most Earth sailors will have a propeller as a backup, but just make sure it's not a combustion engine because there's no oxygen in space. Hey, you like my shirt? Well, you can have one of your own. You know we got a merch store, don't you? You didn't know? Well, check out what's in it by going to shop.underknown.com. There's shirts, mugs, stickers, our book, The What If 100, hats, hoodies, and more. We've got it all. All right, one of the spookiest places on our planet used to be the Bermuda Triangle, but 
over the last few decades, people have lost interest in it. So now there's a new, more mysterious triangle, bigger and better than before. And it's in space. Did you know that there's a mysterious area in space where astronauts are unable to communicate with home base? They're exposed to extreme levels of radiation and their spaceships start to malfunction. It's being dubbed the Bermuda Triangle of Space. This area has perplexed scientists for decades, but astronomers may have finally solved this outer space anomaly. What exactly is the Bermuda Triangle of Space anyway? Well, its official name is the South Atlantic Anomaly, or SAA for short. It's hovering above the South Atlantic, stretching from Chile to Zimbabwe, and this area has a considerably weaker magnetic field when compared to the rest of the Van Allen radiation belt. The Van Allen radiation belt is a pair of cosmic donuts surrounding Earth. This is a unique location where the radiation belt comes closest to the Earth's surface. These belts trap particles that shoot from the sun, which protects the Earth from harmful radiation. The solar radiation within the South Atlantic anomaly isn't held back to the same degree, though. But why? Well, to explain that, first, let's dive into what happens if you wander into this terrifying part of our solar system. The SAA is known for causing electronic malfunctions in spaceships and extreme radiation exposure for astronauts. It can completely destroy spacecraft. In 2016, the Japanese satellite Hitomi came crashing down to Earth after satellite operators began getting mixed signals from the ship. It was reporting inaccurate data about how it was performing up in space, making people down on Earth think that everything was fine, but this was happening as it traveled through the SAA, so operators weren't aware that there was a problem and couldn't take steps to correct it. The Hubble telescope, luckily, has managed to avoid any issues while traveling through the SAA. That's despite spending a whopping 15% of its time in the space anomaly. To protect the telescope, satellite operators power it down. If they didn't, the SAA could corrupt any precious data that's being collected and potentially crash. But how do astronauts deal with these heavy levels of radiation? Well, their radiation levels are constantly being monitored, so if they do end up in the anomaly, they have what's known as a water wall. Certain rooms on ships are filled with these massive bags of water, and if you stand behind them, they'll protect you from radiation. Water is the best thing to shield you from this harmful energy because of its high hydrogen content. Now, if they didn't have this water wall, they could get severe radiation poisoning or even cancer. So we know the radiation levels are much higher and more dangerous in this specific part of space, but why is it happening in the first place? Well, despite what pictures might show you, Earth isn't completely round. It bulges around the center, like me. And because of this, the Earth's physical center and its magnetic center are slightly off by about 500 kilometers. This offset means things like cosmic rays can get closer to the Earth's surface near the bulging area. Luckily, the Earth's magnetic bubble can still keep all those dangerous rays from getting to us, but that's not the case for people in space above the South Atlantic. Because of this, stronger radiation levels can reach this point up in space. And what's even more concerning? Due to the fact that the magnetic poles here on Earth are constantly changing, the South Atlantic anomaly keeps growing. It's also gotten weaker by 15%, meaning the radiation has gotten stronger in the area. So NASA has been carefully monitoring the SAA since 2019. They've noticed that the anomaly is moving west. And what's even weirder, the anomaly is also splitting in two. If this continues, it could make things even more complicated regarding space travel and data collection. But Luckily, for it to change significantly would take millions, if not billions, of years. So, this Bermuda Triangle of space isn't as mysterious as it sounds, and astronomers are getting better at handling it with every new ship launch and every piece of data recorded. Six hundred and thirty-five light years from where you are sitting, way out there in outer space, 
lies a planet. The first planet to be discovered within the habitable zone of a sun-like star. Its name is Kepler-22b. When a planet is located within a star's habitable zone, it means there's a chance that liquid water exists on its surface. And where there's water, there's also the possibility of life. Human life. How long would it take to get to Kepler-22b? What would the weather be like over there? And why would you need to get jacked before arriving on this new planet? This is what if, and here's what would happen if you live on Kepler-22b. Kepler-22b is what scientists call an exoplanet. It's a planet outside our solar system. Spotting an exoplanet like Kepler-22b is often not easy. The bright glare of the stars they orbit tends to keep them hidden from our telescopes. What did scientists come up with to get around it? Looking at the stars themselves to see if they can find anything unusual about them. They spotted Kepler-22b using what's called the transit method. They watched Kepler-22, the star this exoplanet orbits around, and noticed that its brightness changes over time. That was because Kepler-22b was blocking the star's light. With this, scientists were able to learn both the size of 22b and how it orbits. And it looks like this distant space rock could become our next home. Okay, but what do we really know about Kepler-22b? Its mass is 36 times that of Earth, with a radius of two and a half times larger than ours. One year on Kepler-22b is 290 days. It's also located 15% closer to its star than we are to the Sun. If Earth scooched over that close to our star, you'd be fried. Kepler-22b, on the other hand, is lucky to have a sun that is remarkably similar to ours, but also smaller and cooler. This close proximity to its star allows the planet to receive about the same amount of sunlight as we get over here. The temperature on Kepler-22b could be about 15 to 22 degrees Celsius similar to Earth's spring weather and quite habitable if you ask me. But our galaxy can be a cruel place and not everything is good news. Some models suggest Kepler-22b is rotating on its side, kind of like our very own Uranus. This may sound insignificant, but it adds potentially deadly complications. This would mean that its north and south poles are shrouded in either darkness or sunlight for half a year. And this ain't simply a matter of whether you're a daytime or a nighttime person. A world like Kepler-22b spinning on its side means that temperatures could change from boiling to freezing, which wouldn't be great for human life. I know, what a bummer, but... Don't despair yet, because our galaxy is also big enough to include some hope. New studies suggest that Kepler-22b might be covered in an ocean 50 meters deep. And that ocean would be able to act as natural climate control, keeping the wild temperatures at bay. You see, an ocean can store heat in the summer and release it during the winter, which results in a mild climate like you needed another reason to live close to the water. But hold on, how would you even make it all the way to Kepler-22b? I mean, even if you were traveling at the speed of light, it would take you 635 years. Your best bet could be to hibernate through the trip inside a device that preserves your body way past its natural lifespan, like cryogenic sleep. NASA has already developed a cryosleep chamber that can lower an astronaut's body temperature to as low as 32 degrees Celsius. This would trigger natural hibernation, during which 
catheters would provide your body with nutrients and remove any waste. But even in cryosleep, it would be quite the long, risky trip. This leads us to the most dangerous part about this journey. All that remains unknown about Kepler-22b. For starters, we still don't really know what gravity is like there. It could be twice as strong as our planets. If that was the case, a 10-kilogram sack of potatoes would now weigh 20 kilograms. And your body would also factor into the mix. Is your current weight 75 kilograms? Well, good luck suddenly dealing with 150 kilograms of you. And just for safety, settlers such as yourself would need to bulk up. Really bulk up. Only through intense strength training would you increase your chances of being able to walk on Kepler-22b. And once you got jacked on Earth, you'd have to figure out ways to preserve that muscle through all 635 years of light-speed travel. But humans aren't the only life form that would be affected by a stronger gravity. Plants brought from Earth for oxygen and nutrition might not survive on Kepler-22b when you try growing them there. And if you brought any animals with you, they'd need to step up the evolution process. Higher gravity could lead to creatures developing additional legs to move around. It could also determine the location and size of internal organs. But the mysteries don't end there. Scientists still don't know for sure that Kepler-22b is even a rocky planet. It might be gaseous, similar to Neptune, or it could be entirely covered with water. If you and the other first settlers woke up from your cryosleep and found yourself on a gas planet, yeah, that would be a downer. You wouldn't have a solid surface to even land your ship. Not to mention a place to set up camp. In that case, you and your crew would need to figure out how to build a cloud city orbiting the planet. If you landed on an ocean planet, a submarine town would be in order. Discovering Kepler-22b is a rocky planet would be hitting the jackpot then, right? Well, not so fast. Venus is also made of rock, and yet its dense atmosphere, consisting of greenhouse gases, makes it uninhabitable, with scorching temperatures far too hot for liquid water. If this was also the situation with Kepler-22b, our only chance at thriving on this exoplanet would be to employ robots that could build underground shelters. The place where maybe, just maybe, the temperature might be cool enough for you to bear. It just goes to show you that a prime location is no guarantee for human survival. And as exciting as it might seem to find other worlds to inhabit, our own Earth remains the perfect habitat for humanity. But sometimes, the slightest change can shake its ideal balance. Just turn off the oxygen supply for five seconds and a raging sunburn is in the cards for you. But that's a story for another What If. Okay, well, we've come to the end. Thanks for joining us here on our stunningly stupefying swing through space. I hope you learned something. I know I did. It's let's take care of the planet we have so that we don't have to leave and colonize some ball of rocks 200 parsecs away. But that's a story for another What If. This blue marble-like planet looks just like Earth, but only five seconds on this hostile death orb would kill you. Welcome to HD 189733B, 